Welcome back to the weekend with Anthony Opperman. Coming up shortly, we'll sit down and chat with Chris Denovit for the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Chris had another couple of successful fishing trips that we'll catch up with him about, as well as talking some tackle as he and I conquered the sportsman's triad. But before we get to Chris, there was something that I wanted to delve into a little bit. And I had an interesting experience last weekend while watching the TCU Boise State game. Now, obviously, I'm a proud TCU Horn Frog alum. And while I don't often allow myself to be a fan, and it's difficult after working in baseball for a few years and, and being on the business side of the game, sometimes you forget what it's like to be a fan. But TCU sports, and specifically TCU football, is where I kind of allow myself to continue to go into that realm. And while I was watching the TCU Boise State game, obviously it was very close all the way down to the end, I found myself being really emotionally involved in this game. And at the very end, so much so the last minute and five seconds, I couldn't even sit down, pacing around the room, going back and forth, hands on top of my head, clapping at good moments, gasping at bad moments. And I had to stop myself and think, wait a second, where is this coming from? Because again, you spend some time on the business side of things, it changes your perspective a little bit on how you view sports. You're looking at it through a business perspective. You're looking at it through the X's and O's and the stats and the strategy more so than you are from a typical fan perspective where you have a genuine rooting interest. And the emotion that I felt got me thinking, where does this come from? So I wanted to devote this segment to going to try and find a little bit of the answers to that. Reached out to the Department of Psychology at VCU, and I was fortunate enough to hook up with Dr. Stephen Danish, and he joins us now. Dr. Danish, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start off with you talking about what draws individuals to professional sports teams. How are these bonds formed? Well, it could be because you live in the town where the, where the team is playing. It could be because you like the logo and you think that's a cool, cool uh, logo and a cool team. You could like some of the players and you just kind of uh, gravitate toward uh, uh, that team. It could be also because you like someone who's down and you want to see them win. What causes fans to become emotionally involved at that point? I mean, it's one thing to experience that connection and, and to root for a team because they're from your hometown. But it's another thing altogether to become emotionally involved. Well, especially when they're from your hometown or, you know, you grew up near there or whatever, you start to feel like they, they are you. And they are an indication of how good you are. So you take it very personally and you take, the, you take that team as, a, as an indication of your worth. And so they have to do well because you need to feel like you're a worthy person. And joined by Dr. Stephen Danich from VCU's Department of Psychology. And you talk about that emotional tie, but Sometimes it even goes beyond just experiencing the emotions, whether it's joy, whether it's nervousness. Sometimes it even becomes an, a, a physical representation, whether it's pacing around the room because you're nervous or whether it's you know, clenching your fist because you're excited or clapping, uh, which is probably the most natural reaction to something good uh, or positive happening on the field or on the court. Uh, how... how is that create where does that come from that physical response to the emotion well if you're on the field you get rid of all those feelings in the game and you can see if you, if you watch the beginning the a beginning kickoff for example when they come down the field uh, there's more emotion in that first tackle than in a lot of other places as the as as the game goes on because they're getting rid of all this pent-up energy well, if, you're, if you go to the game, you can yell loud. You can let loudly and scream and, and uh, complain, do whatever you want. When you're in your home, it's harder. So 
how do you get rid of all that energy? And I think some people get rid of all that energy by walking around and pacing, by going in the other room and get something to eat, and then coming back. And hopefully that you've missed a bad, you know, the call went the right way when you went to get the food. So a lot of people walk out of the room when, when things are going badly and get something to eat and hope when, when, when they come back, things are going to be better. I mean, people talk a lot about how watching some of these games during this uh, uh, holiday time really uh, affects people's uh, eating behavior and health in a negative way. Because sometimes they're so anxious and, and nervous about the outcome of the game that between eating and drinking and um, the stress they feel, it may have a negative effect on their health. That's an interesting perspective when you have that kind of energy just in a room by yourself or maybe with one or two other people. That's one thing. But when you put an entire stadium or arena filled with people who are experiencing those same emotions, I mean, you look at some of these major college football venues, we're talking over 100,000 people, many of whom are experiencing the same emotions at the same time. How does that affect the individual's emotion in an environment like that? You know, in some ways, I think you can get, uh, you, it, it's, it's helpful because you get some of the emotion out along with these other people and you don't necessarily feel as tense. You, you can concentrate more on the game itself rather than the, than the internal emotions that you're experiencing. So I, I would say, yeah, you hear a lot of noise, but I think that's more uh, the fact that there are the 100,000 people in the stadium. Individually, I think it's a little bit easier on the, on the individual to go to the game rather than to watch it on television. It's also more expensive, but whatever. <laughs> Again, joined by Dr. Stephen Danish from VCU's Department of Psychology. And Dr. Danish, we were talking beforehand about how individuals in a professional setting can be so different than they are during a sporting event like this. And you're, while it's healthy, certainly, to get some of these emotions out and, and to be able to experience some of these emotions, sometimes it turns into the ultimate heckler. And sometimes the, the meanest hecklers in the crowd are guys that you would least expect. Exactly. Um, I uh, spent a year uh, as an assistant coach trying to understand, because I did a lot of sports psychology, I wanted to see what it was like on the other side of the bench. So I, wanted to, I had a chance to work with a team for a year uh, Division Three women's basketball team, which actually the year afterwards went to a went to the Final Four, but not the year I was there. Um, I wanted to see what that was like because when I when I'm at a game and I'm watching a game with people in the stands, some people are really, out, you know, outrageous and and you know need to be. Uh, taken care of, I think, because some of the things they say are out of line. One of the things that I learned and I firmly believe in watching in, in basketball is that, for example, they'll go after officials and they'll talk about officials doing, you know, throwing the game or doing whatever. I learned, I think, and I think coaches often will say this to you, that an official will lose or win a game for you maybe once a year, maybe once a year. So that's why coaches try to, get their try to get their team to concentrate on the game and the other team rather than trying to argue with the officials. And they, they want to, you know, they, as a coach, they want to be able to argue with the officials if anyone's going to do it because they can do that a little bit more comfortably than the athlete can. When the athlete gets really uptight about the, you know, gets angry at an official, it affects his or her performance during the game. And that's not good. And it could affect uh, a coach's performance during the game too if they, if they get so upset. So 
I kind of think that some of these coaches who are are good yellers, I, I think of Gary Williams before he retired at Maryland. I imagine he must have had some way of control. It must have been something he did. He knew how to do. You talk about the reaction of fans and sometimes being in a negative way. One of the stories that's obviously made national headlines was the tragic and absolutely brutal beating of San Francisco Giants fan Brian Stowe at a Los Angeles Dodgers game. And this, on the surface, seems like something that is just inexplicable. Why fans from one team cannot coexist with another and obviously this has been going on as long as sport the rivalries between fans and fans having altercations in the stands when it's taken to this level obviously that is an extreme case but what causes these tensions and what would cause somebody to you look at it rationally here's somebody that they've never met they know nothing about but yet they may not stand the individual and again we're talking about people who at times, could be absolutely civil if they may have met in a different setting. Yeah, I don't really know much about that situation, except I knew someone was was really badly injured. I don't know who the perpetrators are and whether they were fans or hooligans. And I, I, and that happens in, in Europe a lot with soccer. I, I know there are a lot of fan, and, you know, anger and, and, uh, and, and sometimes fighting. It's interesting because, you know, the players don't feel as badly about that. The players, when the game is over, often, you know, that's it. And, and most players know players from other teams and, and, and like those players. So this is just something fans need to do because they have no way of getting rid of that emotion and they're so tied to that team. So I, I don't understand why that happens. Um... You know, someone needs to, to get some Valium, I think, is the only <laughs> answer I can say to that. And joined by Dr. Stephen Danish from the Department of Psychology at, at VCU. And, and Dr. Danish, before I let you go, one other topic I wanted to delve into with you, and that is fan superstitions. And I think it's interesting to see how different fans, especially, again, when they're watching at home and they're not actually at the game, but the different superstitions that fans have from not watching a game, if things aren't going well, going to another room, to if things aren't going well, sitting in one chair, moving to another chair, or whatever little thing it may do, whether it's wearing a certain shirt or certain apparel, it's Again, on you look at it from an outside perspective, it somewhat seems like irrational behavior. There well, is <laughs> superstitions are irrational behaviors, but because it worked once, then you start to kind of think it might work again. So you hope that if you move your seat when this happens, you know things are going to work out. And if they don't, well, you know, then you say, well, that it didn't work out that time, but it worked out the time before, so I'm going to keep it. And people have these superstitions, and they keep keep them for a long period of time. And it, you're, when you can't control something, what you're trying to do is control it. And superstitions are, are an effort to control things you can't control. Dr. Danish, it's definitely been a, an interesting conversation, a different take on things that for so many people are just normal, everyday uh, reactions to watching sporting events, but something that I don't think we really step back to, to analyze and look at very much. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck. Again, that's Dr. Stephen Daniels from the Department of Psychology with VCU. When we come back, we'll catch up with Chris Dunavant and get that wildlife report. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Weekend with Anthony Opperman, Sports Radio 910. The Weekend with Anthony Opperman continues next on Sports Radio 910.